Hi and welcome back to the second talk for Building Ireland's Stay at Home and Map IRL event. Unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, the beginning and the end of this talk were not recorded properly. But without further ado, please listen to the most excellent talk by Eduardo from Mapillary. In time differences between it, when a street was, was covered. So keeping in mind that even though it might be green on Mapillary, just checking when that last drive was, it's, it's always better to have new imagery. So even if it was captured in the last two years, it's probably worth driving again and having that up-to-date imagery for OpenStreetMap purposes. Looking at the current state of the map in Dublin, which is probably where the most contributors are, I just can illustrate the point here. So it looks like a lot of Dublin's covered, and, and I think it's pretty impressive as far as global communities go. Uh, there are few individuals contributing the vast bulk of the imagery, which is what we see in most locations. And then in the in the bottom image there, you can see, well, in the last 12 months, what does coverage look like? So if we're editing the map and we wanted to see a perspective of Dublin from the last 12 months, it's quite a different picture, a lot less coverage. And so that's oh, that's where the opportunity is to really up, keep it up to date and make sure that the data that we're adding is representative as much as possible of a ground truth in recent times. And, and you guys will know better than anyone in Dublin and, and Cork and, and other cities which um, which imagery is most useful for you and, and like whether you can trust it if it's a year old. And in some cities, it probably doesn't change too much and in other locations, it might change significantly. So when Kieran contacted me, the thing that we were discussing was building data. And so I, I was just, buildings is something that Mapper is particularly useful because from a satellite imagery image, I think most of us are generally just tracing that building outline and tagging it as probably just building, sometimes maybe house, but I know I myself find it very difficult to know what that particular building is. And that's where street level imagery comes in. If you're not particularly familiar with that neighborhood, or even if you are, but there's just a lot of buildings and it's hard to keep track of what's what from a satellite image, Mapflurry gives you that extra level of, level of detail. And that's helpful for pretty obvious reasons, things like the number of levels the buildings have. If you're trying to do some renderings, there are some cool rendering tools that um, take that 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 key and the value there and and render it based upon that. So that's a good one to have in. Obviously, the name of the building, if it's associated with a particular company or use case or it's a hospital. Um, level of granularity here, like, you know, points of interest, amenity equals fast food, which makes the map a lot more useful for the end users. And, and that's just going to make OpenStreetMap uh, better and better over time as, as we have more people utilizing tools like Open, OSM and and Maps.me and then other applications that are use, utilizing OSM data now like Facebook and uh, Mapbox is still putting pulling a lot of data from OSM, Apple uh, and, and other companies out there that, that rely on a lot of OSM data to, to create their base maps. Some other ones that I'll get to whoops, in a second, uh, wheelchair accessibility, really helpful. There's been a lot of projects that have taken image, images and, and gone through and looked at the entrance of the building and, and whether uh, it's accessible for people of, um, in wheelchairs. House numbers, of course, not always available or, or not always visible in that flurry, but an, another one, a lot of address data is missing in most countries. And it's probably one of the biggest challenges we as an open street map community have to address, no pun intended. And then entrances as well, I think is increasingly interesting to look at. So we've got people adding address data, but the next level is actually helping with deliveries and um, people like in large apartment complexes so that they can know exactly which node or potentially multiple nodes are associated with the entrance of that building. Uh, were there any questions up to this stage before I get into image capture a bit more? Right, I'll carry on. So this was a, a slide I put together for a project we have going on now to capture imagery and utilize it for navigation purposes in low and middle income countries. 
So I was just telling them about the different ways they can capture. And we've got some pretty innovative examples here of people capturing on foot, people capturing on motorbikes and not even having the proper mounts to do so, but finding a way to be able to um, still capture pretty, pretty useful, like level with the horizon street level imagery. Um, and then in Ghana, their, their mount broke. So they, they were innovative and they, they drove, I think, halfway across Ghana to capture some of the major highways that weren't currently mapped. And they did it all with some sticky tape and a few sticks. So there's no excuses. You, you can always find a way to mount your device. And if you don't, I recommend getting in touch with Kieran. Um, if he doesn't have mounts at the moment, he, he should soon from us. Um, so he's always been kind enough to, to distribute car mounts, which you can put in your windshield uh, and, and attach your smartphone to, to drive down the street and capture images. And yeah, just a note on the car mounts as well. Usually we mount them on the front, the front windshield just because it gets you that perspective of both sides of the road and, and really clear um, image. But if you're mapping buildings, then maybe you want to mount on the passenger window or orientate it 45 degrees to the left, that's up to you. Uh, but always good to have multiple angles of coverage for mapping buildings and, um, and other features. So in terms of using the app, if you open it up on Android or iOS, you're going to see something very similar to this. And this is the capture mode. So this is when, when you click on the camera icon in Mapler, you'll see this capture mode. It's just a normal camera viewfinder like you're used to seeing, but it's got this, uh, this tool to help you level the image with the horizon. And that's recommended in almost every case, just to make sure that the imagery is, is really useful. It helps us as a company like reconstruct it. So behind the scenes, we're processing your images and we're creating a 3D reconstruction. And that helps us identify points like traffic signs and crosswalks and street lights, like the ones you see here. Um, that's all stuff we can extract automatically. We do a better job when the image is clear and, and un unobstructed. So the first thing you're gonna do, as I said, open that up. You'll get indications on the battery percentage that you have and how much storage is left on your device. MapLoy unfortunately consumes a lot of those two things. So always good to have a battery pack. Um, it's just a high intensity activity taking a photo every few seconds. You can see here, he's waiting for a GPS signal. It, it was currently, it was good. And then it went to best. Uh, so this is when ideally you start capturing, but even if, if the best you can do is good in this case, uh, that, that's probably the case in downtown Dublin when, where you've got taller buildings then that's fine too, as long as you wait till it's at least good and, and ideally, as I said, um, best. That, that means that the images you upload are going to be closer to where you actually were on the ground. Uh, the other thing to point out here is the mode of capture. So in the top right, you, you see the M here, and then a couple of slides ago, you would have seen the A. That just indicates automatic and manual. I would say 90% of the time I have it in automatic probably even more than that actually. And that's because it just takes photos as I walk or as I drive or as I ride my bike. It, it, it's based on the GPS or you can make it time-based. Time so you can tell it, capture imagery, you know, whenever I've moved three meters or you can tell it to capture images um, twice a second, whatever you think is best for your purpose. But automatic mode is a lot more convenient there because you can just set it up in your car, you can drive and it'll take images in the background. That's the, the modes of capture. And then on manual mode, you're able to do things like stand on the side of a street corner and take a photo, like a 360 panorama of everything you see there. And that could be useful in particular for this building context. If, if there's particularly important buildings like museums or government buildings or historical landmarks in different parts of Ireland that you'd like to have added, then maybe this is the mode. You have someone go there and try to capture as much as they can in manual mode of just those key things, really clear images, and then they can upload those and you've got a really um, useful image to utilize later on. Down, that, down there is uh, the button to change sequence. So you can think of sequence as just a series of images and that's a logical, uh, a logical construct to have, you know, if you're driving down a um, 
if you're driving down a particular road, you can consider that one sequence and then maybe you start another sequence driving down another road or, or if you're stopping capture and starting again an hour later. Just sequences is a useful way to think about different intervals with which you've captured. Just emphasizing again, image quality. So imagery like this is not very good. It's annoying for mappers. If you're going, you're zooming in on, um, you know, Galway or wherever and, and it's, well, I guess Ireland looks like this most of the time, but if it's rainy and <laughs> hard to see, there's, there's rain on the windshield. Um, it just makes it hard for people to discern what's actually going on in the image, particularly if it's at night or the camera's blurry. So I know you can still discern some stuff here, but it's probably going to be hard to read the building names. It's probably going to be hard to see any address numbers. So if you can, you don't necessarily have to wait for a sun any day, but make sure the camera is level with the horizon and hopefully there's minimal obstructions in the image as well. Before I touch on upload, any questions on the capture side of things? Excellent. So on the upload side, uploading is very straightforward if you're utilizing a smartphone because every image you take will just go to this little upload tab down here. So before we're in capture mode, here in upload, and that will show all those different sequences that we were talking about earlier. And you can either upload them one by one by clicking that gray button there, or you can click on the green button to upload them all at once. And hopefully on Ireland's high speed internet, that's not an issue. Uh, hopefully the upload's pretty, pretty quick. Most people prefer to run it overnight, depends on how you've captured. And then those images will appear on Mapillary and, and that will vary depending on how many people are uploading and um, you know if if there's a lot of images coming into our system then things processing might slow down a bit but hopefully it's generally a couple of hours before you'll see an image on the platform so keep that in mind if you're planning to edit with the images that you've just uploaded there's also the desktop upload, I don't know how many have used that, but this is particularly useful if you don't have a smartphone and you're using another camera, like a, an action camera. A lot of the modern action cameras, they have GPS embedded, which is a huge help. And that means that you can just drag and drop geotagged images into this application. And it runs on Windows and Mac OS. Very simple tool, um, just drag and drop the images and then they'll, actually they've got to be in a folder. So create a folder, put the images in that, drag and drop the folder into the application. And then those images will appear on the map. And you have useful tools, like you can select to upload to your account, or if you're a part of an organization, like, um, uh, you know, there could be a group in Ireland where you're just trying to coordinate building mapping, for example, that could be the building, uh, island building mapping organization. So you could say, uh, the big C uploading on behalf of island building mapping. And then all the big C's images would be going into that organization, but you'd still know it was coming from the big C. So useful tool to be able to coordinate what you're doing together um, and keep this in mind if you do have an action cam available. There's command line tools as well. I won't go into those today, but I'm very happy to, uh, to walk you through if you have any questions on those. They're useful if you if you want a bit more granularity in terms of how you set up your uploads so you might want to skip images that are further than or that are um closer than five meters uh, apart or you might want to you know work with videos that are a bit more difficult to handle um, and take a certain number of frames per second so the command line tools are useful for that and as i said happy to walk you through via email um, or on twitter or forums wherever and help you with that if that's something you think would be useful Just to cover a few more workflows, and then we can try, try out OSM ID editor and see how my internet connection holds up. One that we've been talking about a lot lately is pedestrian safety. So one of the really cool things about Mapillary that I mentioned earlier is every image you upload is being processed, and we create that 3D reconstruction behind the scenes. And then we try to label every pixel. It's AI labeling each pixel and trying to classify it into a set list of categories. So some of those categories might be pretty generic things like vegetation, sky, um, but others are 
are pretty useful for mapping purposes. And one of those is, for example, lane marking crosswalk. And we also have a, a more generic crosswalk, which you'd see at uh, traffic uh, intersections with traffic lights. And these are available for OpenStreetMap. And that's something I'd like to show you just quickly today that enables you to go through the map and, and see features like this and add them in pretty easily and hopefully add a lot of map features that weren't there previously. In terms of like the tagging in OpenStreetMap, uh, again, mapillary imagery could help with things like sidewalk equals both left, right. No, I, I don't know how sidewalks are mapped in Ireland if you map them directly on the road itself and, and, and use this to indicate whether there's a sidewalk available or whether you actually mark them individually as a way on either side of the road. But mapillary is useful for that in both cases. Um, footbridges as well, and then the crosswalks that I mentioned earlier. And this is just an example, like in this particular image, there's a lot of uh, nearby mapillary imagery to utilize. It gets a bit messy, but you can navigate it through here and ID it as well. And you can see the crosswalk here. You can see that um, the curb is wheelchair accessible from what I can see there. I probably need to zoom in a bit. You can even see, is there tactile paving that someone who is who has limited eyesight would be able to utilize? Uh, does, the, does the traffic light have a a push to walk button or maybe even a, a some countries i noticed in singapore for example they had a button specifically for elderly people to be able to press it and um and, and that would make the, the crosswalk go slower for them and i kept accidentally pressing it because i thought it was for for everyone but um that that's something that you could add to open street map as well all these all these very specific things related to pedestrian navigability. And then it's up to developers of apps like OSMN to, to work out how they incorporate that data and make it useful for people going from A to B. I touched on wheelchair accessibility a bit then, but in terms of buildings, you can see here that the, obviously the stairs make this building wheelchair access equals no unless there's stuff around the side so keeping an eye on like the, the facade the, the front facade of the building maybe even try to see if there could be a potential back entrance that is wheelchair accessible but this is really helpful for creating disability friendly maps of your city and um, doesn't take much to do it's very useful with street level imagery and can make life a lot easier for someone else that is, is just trying to work out which services they, they want to utilize. Maybe they go to one restaurant over another just because they know that it's not going to be an absolute pain for them to visit it. And then another one that's close to my heart is, is cycling. So um, a lot of different cycling related features you can add here. I think we're looking at Ottawa at the moment um, where there is um, very specific cycling infrastructure mapped out on OpenStreetMap. So they've actually separated the way, which is good. And you can see on the, in real life as well, it, it's pretty clearly designated. And you can put things like the surface type, smoothness type, and whether it's shared path or whether it's just bicycles. And I know for a fact that this is highly utilized by apps that cyclists use for navigation. So if they can see that the speed limit next to the cycle path is 100 um, for, for regular cars, and that's quite concerning for a cyclist, they might down, route down a quieter road. And all the data you input here is, is incredibly useful for that. Uh, the other point, so, so like how does this work in practice? I think a really good example is Bike Ottawa. This is an organization in Canada that really it's probably one of the best in the world I've seen at, at collecting a lot of data and using that to advocate to the government for actual safer practices and infrastructure changes. And so they have most of the city covered on Mapillary. They've cycled a lot of different paths and tried to import as much of that data as possible into OpenStreetMap. But then some of the practical implications of that are like they've been very, very vocal to the government that there was an incident. Um, in, there was a, a situation where the government was building a new highway and I think it had a, a major bridge and I think they'd considered the cycle path along along a significant portion of that highway and then when it got to the bridge, the cycle path just wasn't considered at all and they were able to ride that um, and really clearly show 
where the cycling infrastructure was was inadequate and lobby for that. There was another location quite close to the Ottawa City Hall, I think it was, and a cyclist had actually un- unfortunately died along that road. And there was no separation between the cars. And, well, there was a, there's separation between the cars and the, cycle, the bike lane, but it was not very clearly marked. And so they actually advocated to have um, plastic barriers put up and make make it bright green like this one. And you could see on map the time lapse as this cycle infrastructure was upgraded over time. So maps are an incredibly useful tool to convey information and whether it's cycling that you're passionate about or wheelchair accessibility that you're passionate about, they help someone on the other side understand where you're coming from and, and understand the problem from a spatial point of view. And that often helps in coming up with a solution and, and taking action. That can include bicycle parking, bike rental as well. I think there's a lot of different uh, ideas that you'll get there. And then just that wheelchair accessibility example before, this is in uh, Istanbul, my colleague uh, Saeed, he was working on, on this, mapping out wheelchair accessibility. And then over time, you can see how many buildings have wheelchair accessible um, entrances and, and how many don't. And this is something you can visualize in a multitude of ways. So I want to demo OpenStreetMap ID Editor first and foremost. Any questions at the end of that presentation? So we have a couple in the chat, if you want to have a look there. Oh, wonderful. Oh, this is a bit um, meta, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so the big C wanted me to sing. That's not happening. The location of an entrance. Excellent question. Okay, about the capture. Those guidelines there are just to keep it parallel with the horizon. Yeah, so keeping it in line with the horizon, um, you don't need to match them with roads necessarily. You could be walking down in the middle of an oval or a um, a sports pitch, but yeah, just to keep it level with the horizon. And there might be some exceptions to that. Like if you're trying to map really tall buildings, you might elevate the camera upwards a bit above the horizon. But as a general rule, that just helps to keep the imagery stable and as I said, that improves with the 3D reconstruction and all the features that we identify. And then you're asking about creating an organization using the phone app. Um, good, great question, actually. So that's something that has to be done on Maplery. So I can show you how to do that. That's super straightforward. Skip the step and go to maplery.com slash app, which will take us direct to the web viewer. And I apologize in advance, my internet has been very slow since this whole uh, crisis started with the virus. It seems to just be the case of too many people working at home on substandard Australian internet. So up here in the top right, you see my user account. And if you click there and scroll down, you can create a new organization. So that's what you want to do there. And you can create building. um, Let's go through an example now. So Buildings, Ireland. I might give it a bad name just so that you guys can use use that one if you wanted it later on. Ed test. I'll just call it Ed. So I'll create. Oh, too long. Like I can't count. All right, let's try that. Okay. So now I've created an organization. And this is, in some ways, you can think of it as a like a shared folder in which you can upload imagery as a as a team, as a as a as a group of people interested in a similar concept. And so to create that team going, you're going to need people in the team. So I'm going to add some people here. Right. So I've added you. Oh, I can set your um, privileges here as well. So I'll make you an admin. That means you can manage the organization, add other users as well, um, help add everyone on this call. You can view imagery. 
and uh, play around with a lot of those features. Uh, another cool thing about organizations is, is you can create shapes and areas of interest. I won't go into that too much today, but um, maybe something to check out. We have good help pages that cover that as well. And that it allows you to see how much coverage is in a particular area. Um, and then there's other stuff there as well, but I don't want to get into it too much today, but a useful thing to look at nonetheless. And create data verification as well. So I don't know if Erwin's on the call again. Uh, it doesn't look like he is, but he's been a fantastic user of this. He's created an organization in the Philippines and created verification projects around fire hydrants. Fire hydrants is one of the things Mapillary detects automatically, and he used this verification project to improve our algorithms in terms of detecting fire hydrants in Manila and specific to the Manila style of fire hydrant. So he created the project here, defined it in this area of interest, which was which is based upon that shape that you create, and then had people going through almost in a gamified way saying, yes, you've did identified the fire hydrant correctly, or no, this is not a fire hydrant. And that helps remove bad, bad data, but also helps improve our algorithms. So, um, yeah, so that's the um, that's the the organization side of things, and I will show you a few other aspects in a second. So I'll just answer Bianca's next question. Uh, you can up, you can actually check the images on your phone. So that slide I showed. I showed earlier this one here. You can actually view the images you've taken and go through them and delete them, which is nice. But probably best to upload or, or to copy across to your laptop and, and edit with edit them there. It's quite cumbersome to do on your phone. And so and on the, the topic, uh... There'd also be some privacy stuff which happens in the back end, as far as I understand. Yeah, that all happens on the back end. Good point. Yeah, so the, is every image that's uploaded, we process it to blur faces and license plates. And so you won't see an image on Mapillary until that step has taken place. Why do we not use drones? Good question. I think one of the reasons is that the the style, the imagery is quite different. So drones, particularly some of the stuff that you're seeing in, in the mapping space, they're often quite high up and looking down at the ground or um, orthogonally, and that really doesn't doesn't uh, fit in well with the the computer vision algorithms that we've got in place to reconstruct a three D street scene. So all the technology we're creating is about how can we identify a 3D street scene and classify objects within it. And drones is just a, a different, um, you know, similar technology in the whole, but, but we're not really optimized for that use case. So we're trying to do this use case very well. Maybe drones is something that would uh, look at in future, but I think there's a lot of great organizations doing that at the moment that, that we can work with. Um, Open Aerial Maps is a good one where you can upload drone imagery. Um, uh, and then there's uh, organizations like um, uh, Drone Deploy as well. Um, a lot of different organizations in that space that that are trying to do exactly that. Well, I think it's about trying to focus on the street level imagery use case and make sure we do that well. So not getting too much, too many different types of images. And the other thing is even from a simple point of view, our, our interface is designed to show imagery at uh, ground level. There's no concept of elevation or um, levels in Mapillary. So if you're in a certain environment that might have multiple levels like a train station, that can be problematic. Um, and, and that's not really something that we want to build in at the moment. We're focused on that street level scene. But you can imagine if someone was to fly over this with a drone and then I was trying to look at this particular road, that would be problematic for us. So um, I want to show ID Editor now.
This is uh, ID editor, as you would see after enabling the Maplu photo overlay, but that's not something that's gonna come up straight away. So once you've zoomed into ID editor and you've clicked the edit button, you've seen the, the, the nodes and ways appear. You wanna activate the Maplu layer. And um, you can click here to navigate images. We've got different sequences available. Uh, one of the cool things that's available in Jossum, which is another the other editing tool, is you can actually filter by the date in which those images were uploaded. There's a new Maplery plugin for that. Um, I'm having, let's see if I can have any luck with that. I'll let that run in the background. But um, even an ID editor, you, you can pan around, you can get the sense of how many building how many levels a building has whether it's a residential or a commercial property so i could do something like um this is definitely a house so i could classify that here let's see if i can even get the address okay 51 and i think it pertains this is the tricky part often is, is working out which one it uh, pertains to so I think it pertains to this one just here on the left. I think it's on that that little wall there. You can see the start of the wall on the satellite imagery. Often satellite imagery is really useful to have alongside and you just get them to complement each other. So Maxar Premium looks to be the best. So I can mark that address as 51 if it's not there. Oh, okay, I got it wrong. That's 53. That's 55 and that one must be 51 then. And it's already marked as a house. So you guys are a step ahead. I don't think a lot of ours, our buildings are mapped to that degree in, in downtown Melbourne. So that's good to see things like that. Um, if you want to put the levels, uh, that's probably not important, I'm guessing for islands. You've done that too. Um, I probably should have chosen a better example where you guys haven't mapped it in so much detail, but I'm curious who, added, who edited this because I'm hoping that they utilized a lot of Maplery imagery. And when you do that, like let's, I'm, I'm going to see if I can find a building that maybe doesn't have some information. So maybe this one here can add level information. Sometimes it's a matter of finding the right image, which can be a bit difficult, particularly if the image is forward facing. So that's where, if you are doing building mapping specifically, you might want to have side facing imagery. I always try to see if there's anything else I can add the speed limit, um, the number of lanes. This looks like a two lane road. So I want to add that now. Paved. There's sidewalks here that we could map as well if we wanted to do that. I don't want to mess with islands conventions um, in terms of how you have determined to map sidewalks, but that's something that you could do there. Let's see like a two story house there. And one of the things I wanted to show you was that um, <laughs> Mapflow applies the source once you've activated this layer. So if I was to go ahead and change uh, and save that change set, you can see there that it's input street level imagery in Mapflow into the um, into the uh, in, into the change set comments. So I could go in and say added roads, uh, added lanes slash road detail. So that's that. Um, the other thing that's really cool with Mapplery at the moment is that there's the ability to request additional data. So traffic signs is one that's been around for a long while. This is data that Mapplery detects automatically. 
And so if there's any speed limit signs here or pedestrian crossing signs here, they might appear on the map. Um, I'm not sure how quick my internet is going to load these, but you can toggle it there and you'll see the traffic signs appear as little sprites, little icons on the map here. I'm going to let that go in the background. And then, oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong one. Traffic signs is the one you want there. And that was actually the thing I wanted to show you next. So map features is additional point features that we have determined are useful for OpenStreetMap. And that was things like street lights that I mentioned before, uh, crosswalks, um, uh, the fire hydrants, all stuff that you might want to have on the map. And how we're approaching this is that we're getting to you to request data in your area. This is just to make sure it's not being utilized for commercial purposes and that it's being utilized for OpenStreetMap. So you could request data here, that opens up a form. You can say, Ed, Swato, Newhart, put in your email, your website if relevant, um, organization if you're doing this as part of a community group. And then down the bottom provide some information on, on what you're actually trying to do with the data. And then you want to create an area of interest. So go over to Ireland. Use a different location. Put in an old castle, let's say, and create your area of interest. And hit enter, and then you can submit that. And what, what will happen is we'll review that, we'll make sure that it's not being used for commercial purposes, but then we'll make those map features available to you in OpenStreetMap and you'll be able to add things like crosswalks utilizing data that we've uh, produced with AI. So here's an example that you can see uh, in, right, it's probably a bit hard to see there. I'll see if I can zoom in on it. But um, it's a little crosswalk icon on the map. Yeah, that, that one there. And you can probably have a look at this yourself if you want to, and in particular in, in Zanzibar is one of the locations that has data. I think parts of Detroit have this av available already. So I'd love to see a request from Ireland and would be happy to activate that for you there. You can see that speed limits has come up here. So this is something that we can click on and then see which image it's been detected in, see if it was correct and add that to the map that, of course, you guys are on top of it already. Um, and then I mentioned like building names as well, if if that's available, we're, we're in a pretty residential area at the moment, but a lot of points of interest are missing. It's always you know a challenge to keep up. So that's something that we could pan around for as well and, and try to go to a more commercial district, maybe around here, I'll have a look and see if anything here has been missing. I think this is loading very slowly. There we go. It's great to see Linnea all the way from uh, Lesotho captured a lot of imagery in this area. It's good to see everyone chipping in. Okay, so we can see a petrol station further up. I'm guessing that has been added as well, but let's go closer. Circle K. Hmm. Okay, is it here or not? I'm going to double check this. So we've got the gas station available there. And the name is Tractor Motors. So could that be a change in a change in operator? Or is it I know Circle Quay has acquired a lot of petrol stations in, in Sweden as well. So is that what's going on there?
it's just a guess on my part, but it could be that they had a dealership for that particular, uh, so that could be the name of people who sell cars nearby as well. Oh. Okay, so that's something I might leave up to the locals, but I think you get the idea there's like a lot of discernible data from imagery. Um, there's the tab. So that's something I'd probably want to mark on the map. I think um, I would maybe even distinguish the gas station. The gas station looks like it's taking up quite a fair chunk of this block there. So I would probably I would probably draw a polygon around just the, the gas station component. And I'm not sure if we've got more recent imagery. It looks like this this shelter might be this one here. Roof. Okay, so maybe that's the gas station itself. I'd mark that as, as such. Uh, so if I'm not sure, what I can do is just leave a note here. Um, for other mappers to come to, but I think I'll leave it up to Tads or, or Kieran to, to take a look at that one. Uh, you can see another feature, another traffic sign that's been identified here. In this case, it's a, a danger sign, but it thinks it's, I think it thinks it's a slippery road or something. So you see sometimes traffic signs are incorrect. And that's where the verification projects I mentioned earlier are, are really useful. So if you go to your organization up here, you can create verification projects that will remove some of those incorrect detections. The other thing is if you're panning around the map and you want to look at something in more detail, you can zoom in on the image itself, but um, it's best if you click on the bottom right and open that up separately in a different window in that blurry. So not the <laughs> most helpful image from Kieran there. It looks like it was he was traveling at high speed. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, so maybe navigate to a different one there. Okay, this is great. This is where like we can actually, okay, we can confirm now that there is a tractor motors. We can go back and we could even say that they sell um, uh, Fiat and Aston Ma uh, Alfa Romeo. So go back to that, find Tractor Motors. Wow, there's so many different polygons going on here. Building, okay. Let's say car dealership. I call this one Tractor Motors. And they've got Alpha. Mayo. Operator looks to be tractor motors as well. And it looks like it sells new vehicles. but I am going to leave that for a second because I'm not completely sure. And I'm going to save that added detail on car dealership. And you can see the chain shed automatically adds in street level imagery because that, that was something that I utilized. It's added signs as well because that was a layer that I had available, but I don't want that to be shown as a source because I, I wasn't actually relying on the signs there. So I'll hit upload there. These might actually be some of my first edits in Ireland. So that's pretty cool. And yeah, I think that's the main stuff for now. Um, let's see if there's any other questions.